Awesome. So hello, everybody. I'm really excited. Uh, thinking about creativity when it comes to work is a big passion point for me. A lot of the time we think of work as a little more linear, a little maybe a little stifling, but there's all actually a lot of room for creativity. And there's a lot of reasons why creativity should be part of our everyday life when it comes to work. So what are we going to see today? So we're going to see three big things, right? So what, the first thing I want to talk about is why creativity is important when we think about business outcomes. So I know you all know creativity is important on some level. That's why you're here in this webinar. But I want to give you the groundwork and the rationale to really go up and, and tell anybody, OK, this is why we need to be creative. There's an actual business implication when we are creative. Second, we're going to talk about how you do that, right? It can be very hard to think out of the box, to build time in for creativity and inspiration, even when you're working with a big team. So how do we pump the, uh, inspiration for the next big idea? How do we get everybody ready for that? And the last thing I'm going to be showing you are concrete frameworks that you can use to drive creativity in business. So you can literally go out after this webinar, take one of our exercises, run it with your team, and see what great ideas you might be able to come up with. So all we need from you is your listening ear and then later on a little bit of engagement. So we're going to be running a few polls just to see, you know, are the things you're experiencing the same thing everybody else is? And second, you know, what do you think of the frameworks we're sharing? We'll also do one interactive exercise that we can do individually. So if you've got a pen and paper, get them ready. It will be fun and easy. Don't worry about it. And we'll dive into that later on in the discussion. So the first thing I want to talk about is why is creativity so important to begin with? You know, why is it increasingly important? And it's increasingly important because our world is increasingly complex. It's volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, or VUCA for short, right? So if you think about even just a couple years ago, a few, uh, five, 10 years ago, the world might have seemed a lot simpler, right? So if you think about the past two years, you have the pandemic and the rise of remote work, which is a relatively new threat, but you also have longer threats like climate change, which is changing the way people are thinking about uh, the way we live in the world. When you think about the category in the, in the market that you move in, there's increasing competition from even outside the category or new sources like D2C brands or consumers themselves launching their own brands. So one anecdote I've often heard is when you run a competitive scan, for example, a lot of the time you'll see your big players come up, the big players in your category, maybe a Unilever or P&G, but increasingly the size of the pie that others is represented by all those small brands taking nibbles out of the market is increasingly growing. There's more competition. Beyond that, there's also a lot of new opportunities. So new technologies are redefining what's possible. It's increasingly incumbent upon us to explore, okay, how do I make our product better? How do I make our process better? What new technologies are coming on the market that can we can use to make things different. And all of these changes mean that creativity will increasingly be the differentiator for companies. Because you need creativity to figure out what am I going to do that's new with marketing? How do I address remote work or increasing threats of climate change? How do I innovate my business model? And this is something that CEOs all over the world are beginning to recognize. So out of 1,500 CEOs, creativity was ranked as the number one factor for future business success. Above things like discipline, integrity, even vision, when it comes to the CEO, creativity was far more important. And that's because creativity is the skill you need to become comfortable with ambiguity, comfortable with saying, you know, I actually don't know the answer. There may be several answers. Let's figure it out. And that's going to be very important for our times. And this is a big shift. If you think about how businesses run all the way from the 1500s to right now in the 2000s, business has gone through several transitions where there's been a dominant model of business and that's changed through time. So if you think about the 1500s, what made a business successful like the British East India Company, it was reliant on a lot of state power, colonialism, military might, and that is what determined success. 
come the 1790s, the Industrial Revolution, that shifted. It was a lot more about who could standardize better, who could get an assembly line up. And that's where we get the idea of working hours, for example, or shifts with rigid hours and processes. By the 1920s, this was changing again. It wasn't enough to just have a factory, right? You started having management as a career. And that set a lot of norms of what we know today. Increasingly and interestingly, this is also where the idea of prioritizing short-term gains started because people were beginning to do buyouts. So you see the sophistication of business beginning to change. In the 1990s, if you remember, it was all about tech-inspired growth. And this still bleeds into today, right? If you think about the words we use, always in beta, user testing, iteration, all of that is tech-inspired. And that's really what's driving it. But we think about 2022 now, right? What are the defining features of our time? And you have the pandemic, the great resignation, gig workers, startups. These are uncharted waters. And we're in the beginning of figuring out what model will be dominant. And that's why we really need creativity to make it through these uncharted waters. And that's why if you think about, oh, maybe I can make it without creativity, that is a danger signal because what got you here isn't going to be able to take you there. There are increasingly winners and losers when we think about this new era of business. So 52% of the Fortune 500 companies from the year 2000 are now extinct, right? More than half of them are gone, have disappeared in the past 20 years. And 50 years ago, the life expectancy of a Fortune 500 brand was 75 years. Once you made it, you were likely to stay there um, for a very long time. Now it's less than 15. So even really big companies that might have been thought of before as too big to fail are failing, right? And they increasingly have to innovate to stay on top. On the other hand, there's a lot of opportunity. An estimated 9,000 companies could find their way on and off the Fortune 500 list over the next six decades. So a lot of movement, a lot of competition in spaces that are kind of untried and we don't know how to get there. The thing is, now that I've established how important creativity is, is that it can be really hard to be creative in business. And there are certain challenges we face. So the team and I put our heads together and started thinking, what are some of the challenges that businesses might face around creativity? Let us know in the chat, please be active in the chat, if some of these spark um, an echo in your own business, and we'll run a poll later, which ones of these are the most important or that you encounter the most in your own business. So the first challenge is that being virtual can be really hard for creativity. If you think about the energy in a room when you do ideation in person or when you just uh, bounce things off the wall uh, with a colleague who you just kind of crossed um, and the room to talk to, um, it can be really hard when it's virtual and you're just faces in a screen. Sometimes everyone's a mute, but they're all black boxes. It can be very hard. The second thing is that teams might not be diverse and they might not have the expertise of a cross-functional team. So what does this mean? So the, my favorite anecdote is when I was working with PNG. And one of their maxims was, if only PNG knew what PNG knows, then we would be so much further ahead. So, for a lot of the time, might, for example, we might be working with R and D or with sorry, with innovation or insights. But once we brought R and D into the room, suddenly everything that we could do expanded because they could say that actually exists in another category. We're already working on it. We're further along, right? So, how do we get that diversity of of uh, expertise into the room. The third is we might know expertise or creativity is important, but we don't have inspiration or time to get in a creative mindset. And we might all have experienced this before where we're just put in a room and said, okay, come up with a new idea. And it can be very, very hard and a lot of pressure to think about what do I do? Um, how do I how do I start ideating when I have nothing to begin with? That's why we think about priming the pump as really important. The fourth thing is that there might be too many constraints. So one thing about creativity is that it takes a completely different part of your brain from when you're judging. So when you try to ideate, but you have so many guardrails around, we can only do this, we can only do bl razor blades, we can only talk at this manner, this is our brand voice, it gets really, really hard to ideate. 
And the fifth, which is really interesting, is tunnel vision. Sometimes we have too much expertise in the category, and it makes it hard for us to ideate beyond that. So again, if you think of, say, Gillette, maybe, um, in the olden days, uh, and the famous jo the joke was, right, how many razor blades can you add? Because in their mind, that was what innovation was. It was how many razor blades can you fit on a single razor to guarantee a closer shave? And we all saw how Dollar Shave Club and all those new razor startups really disrupted that kind of thinking. So I'm going to stop here and put up a poll. I know we've all faced one or two of these in our, um, in our, over our career, and I want to understand which of these do you, resonates with you most? So just go ahead and fill it in. Okay, no inspiration or time to get in a creative mindset. Too many constraints. Yep, yep. Okay, teams are not diverse. Some people are saying teams are not diverse. Okay. Wow, really a spread across the poll. Okay, I think that's it. I'm gonna share the results. So as you can see, there is a really good spread. Um, a lot of people are facing different problems, but there's no problem that people haven't faced. And the winner here, or quote unquote the winner, is that a lot of you feel there's no inspiration or time to get in a creative mindset. That's really interesting. That's exactly what we're going to be talking about next. So for those of you who answered it, seven of you said that, um, hold on to your hats. We're going to start talking about that later. And for those that said teams are not diverse, we're definitely also going to touch on that on a couple slides. So that's really interesting. I'm excited um, to show you guys how to deal with those problems. So let's move on to the second part of our three-parter series, right? Now that we've established how important creativity is, what we might do about it, um, what our problems might face, let's think about how do we prime the pump for creativity? What are some of the ways that EBCO um, has built that in and some ways that you might build in um, creativity? So we're going to talk about four ways today. Here, here are some ways that we do it. So the first way is we step out of our comfort zone. So what's really interesting is a lot of the time when we think about insight, we do deep dives into what's happening now. What are the values now? What are the big competitors now? But we start to look about at what's changing. How might these things change in the future so we can build in new ways of thinking? Second, we listen to the extreme. So we're not just listening to our mainstream consumer or doing research with them. We're listening to the fringes. We're talking to experts that might be a little adjacent to the category to create exactly that, that diversity that some of you said um, becomes a barrier to creativity. Third, and this is a little hard, we're comfortable with ambiguity. You have to learn to find comfort and discomfort and say, obviously, if you're doing something new, there are things you will not know. That's the definition of it. And that can be really uncomfortable for businesses. And that's what we practice every day to say, you know what, we don't know the answer, let's go explore. And that's what breeds creativity. And last, we go out of our way to support creativity. To, your, um, to those that answered before, there was no inspiration or time for creativity. We make that a priority and we'll show you how to do that within your own business as well. So let's talk about the first one. How do we find out what's changing, right? A lot of the times it's about being widely read, but a lot of the times also it's just thinking about not just uh, passively reading the news, passively consuming content, but thinking about what are the implications of this? What does it mean to change? So if you think about the graphic on the bottom as kind of um, a diffusion funnel like this, um, we can start to see how, as you go further and further, the kinds of things you look at change and the lens expands it. So think of a camera and how the lens is expanding. So when you think about what you know about today, a lot of us are experts at this. We know about category landscape, consumer insight, sales data, right? But a few months out, that changes. We start looking at maybe the latest TikTok trends, right? To see what consumers are beginning to do. We look at the newest G2C companies who might be changing the landscape, or we look at latest product launches. For us, we 
do this very simply. We have a Slack channel where we share interesting information and say, hey, this new trend is coming up. This really interesting TikTok is coming up. Maybe we can use this in a project to figure out what are these big signals, right? We also have what we call a fractal map. And if you've worked with us before, you've seen this, right? It's basically a, a grid of all these adjacent categories that we can see and say, hey, what are the latest product launches here? What are people doing in this category? So we stay updated on what might happen. A few years out, it changes again because consumers might not be able to articulate what they want in a few years. So we start looking at things like expert predictions because experts are generally more primed to think about how a big category might be changing. We might be looking at patents to see what's coming up, what people are going to launch. We start looking at concept models to think about, okay, for example, if you think about cars, they launch a concept model first and they showcase that and then they might go off and build it. So we start looking at things that are theoretical today, but on their way to becoming concrete. And we do this, you've attended some of them, you do book club, we do expert interviews, we do webinars and conferences, all these um, expert knowledges from different sources so that we can figure out how that might change. And then last 10 plus years out, so far out, right? Consumers, experts might not be able to articulate um, to to capture the whole picture. So you start looking at big societal changes. You start looking at things like, is there an aging population? That's not going to reverse in 10 years. So how do I start planning for, a, for consumers that are going to be 10 years older or majority of them will be elderly at that point, right? So we start looking that far out. So that's how we find out what's changing. We don't stick to that first step of what you know about today. We start laddering up to see how things might change over the, over the course of time. The second thing we do is we listen to the extremes and we foster diversity. So some of you asked about this, so I'd love, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. So we do this in three ways. One, we deliberately build in diversity with the experts we listen to. So we source diverse experts. So for example, we're working on healthcare. We might talk to doctors and nurses, yeah, but we'll also talk to venture capitalists. We'll talk to lobbyists. We'll talk to activists. So getting as many different points of view as we can to build in diversity deliberately. Second, the people you work with. So for some of you who've attended our workshops, we always have a cross-functional team in brainstorms. We usually have R&D there, we have sales, we have marketing, we have your agency partners, or we might be co-creating with consumers to say, hey, um, what might you think about that? So again, deliberately building it in, and that might be as simple as sending an invite to somebody you would not have invited normally, right? And third are the consumers we interview. So we do this two ways. One, obviously, we source diverse consumers demographically. We make sure that we have good racial, ethnic, um, gender representation, but we also find extreme users. Who are the people who are suffering the most from this? Who are the people who are the cutting edge, the most, the earliest adopters, and can we get their perspective? So for example, we did this for a project on cancer care, and you'll see the diversity of the people we spoke to. So experts, we spoke to a lobbyist, we spoke to an integrated medicine practitioner who did acupuncture and Western medicine, a mental health expert. The consumers, we spoke to people with different types of cancer in different stages and their caregivers so that we got a broad idea of what they might need. And then we co-created with them. And that gave us concepts that tested higher than the client's benchmark, which is a great outcome, but one that we could have said, yes, this is going to happen because we've looked at far larger pool of people and experts and ideas than we normally would have. The third idea is comfort and discomfort. And this is an emotional change, right? This is something you might want to prep your team for, to talk through the discomfort, or just to tell them this is going to be uncomfortable. It's meant to be uncomfortable. And that's hard because companies tend to like linear processes with clear answers. You want to know, this was my sales in 2022. This will be my sales in 2023. It will increase in a linear pattern, or you want a yes and no answer. But a lot of the time, creativity requires a different mindset. You have to move from a linear mindset to an iterative answer. There are several possibilities that might be the answer, and it's often scary. So we do it by making sure we do guided exercises. So we're not just throwing in the deep end. We say, okay, here's step one, let's do this. Here's step two. And that's something you can build into how you do creativity exercises with your team. 
Second is a sense of play. So a lot of the time we bring in things like really fun snacks. We bring in Play-Doh. We bring in drawings to give you a sense of psychological safety. And the last, honestly, is experience. It may be strange the first time, but after the fourth or fifth time you've done this with your team, it comes very intuitive for you to think about, okay, it's uncomfortable, but it's meant to be. And last, we go out of our way to support creativity. So how might you do this and how do we do this? So the first and really important thing is we allow time for creativity to bloom because people need time to warm up. If you think about any activity you do, you need to stop and get out of the mindset of I'm answering emails, I'm coordinating with people too. I'm going to play now. I'm going to come up with 10 ideas, as many as I can. Doesn't matter if they're silly. I'm just going to go for it right? So you need time to feel psychologically safe. And that's why we often have sessions that are just for sharing and play. And we do this internally where we have things like glitter bombs, uh, where we just exchange ideas and talk about um, what's happening in our lives. We have tactile exercises where we ask people to work with their hands to really write down their ideas, use post-its, eat the snacks, make models with Play-Doh, so that they get a sense of play and there's time for them to warm up. The second is you need to invest in creativity. You can't just throw people in. So people need to be inspired and you have to give them a basis on which they can ideate. So this requires maybe sometimes literal investment, right? So we do things like here are, um, here's inspiration overload. Here are 10 huge, amazing products that you can look at. Here are book clubs. We're going to flood you with ideas from monks or venture capitalists. We run webinars so that we're always being primed to be creative. This can be done in your own office. So even if it can just be a matter of bringing in a favorite new product that you've seen emerge in the category or sending somebody um, a link to talk to a great article or a podcast, right? This is not something you can do on the spot. It's something that's really built over time. And last, we reward and we celebrate creativity. So it's not about you go into a workshop and you leave and that's the end of it. You really have to make sure that you reward the people who are creative so that there's something in it for them, so that you're showing them that creativity is important. So it can be simple as shining a spotlight on those that are creative and rewarding them with an award or with maybe or something special. Are you focusing on creativity in dedicated sessions? So you're celebrating the act of being creative. And do you make creativity feel like an incentive and not a chore, not something else to check off their to-do list? So we do this with um, a lot of workshops where we reward um, the people who participate. Our research is often rewarded whenever we share something, everybody's really interested and hops on to talk about it. Our company culture also rewards creativity where we highlight those that do well and are really creative in solving problems, right? So all of these are ways that you build it in. And I am aware these are not small asks, they really are things that build on each other over time. So unfortunately, there's no quick and dirty way to do, um, to support creativity. You can't do it as a one-off. It's something that builds over time. But the good news is you can always join our book clubs, our webinars. If you don't want to do your own, you can always ask us for some ideas. They don't have to be intensive, right? It's how do you play with each other um, in terms of things that you can do? It can be as simple as that. And now we're going to move into our third and for me, the most fun part of this exercise, right? I'm going to talk you through some frameworks that you can really bring in to your business right now, right after this, you can go off and do this with some of your teams um, and think about how do we spark creativity. So we're gonna go through four, some might be familiar to you. Um, let me know in the chat or what your insights might be if you've done this before. And there will be an interactive exercise at the end of it. So the first technique that we do is mind mapping. And I know this is probably really familiar to a lot of you, but honestly, this is the start of how all Edco projects go, right? We always start with a big mind map. Everybody jumps on. We might exchange ideas. We might build a, a, a virtual whiteboard. But because it's by its very nature, mind mapping 
breaks you out of linear and rigid thinking. It's forcing you to see connections between things that might not feel connected and lets you go deeper into adjacent categories. So mind mapping is best done, and this is an insight from uh, my own experience, when you push yourself beyond what's comfortable. So it can be really, really easy to fill in those initial nodes, for example, and then it gets really hard and then you stop. So what we like to do is you set a timer or a set number of nodes, quote unquote, before you stop and say, I'm going to come up with three layers. I'm going to come up with 10 different categories. A lot of the time we think um, for EBCO, we might say we need 70 to 90 different things, right? We really push ourselves to, re to expand the mind map. If you want to do some, um, one of the mind maps together, we do we actually do this for a lot of our um, contacts where we trend map together. So if you're interested, let us know. The second um, is a steep C framework. I'm biased on this because it actually is very useful for me. So if you've heard of steep C, let us know in the comments. Um, what it basically stands for is it's an acronym for different kinds of aspects of a certain trend or a certain change or something you're trying to look at. So S stands for social cultural, T technological, E economic, E letter E environmental, P political, I've added C for category. And what you're trying to do here is for a specific um, subject. So for example, a ton, um, driverless cars, right? I might think of what does, what is the social cultural reason for this? What are the tech enablers of this? What are the economic reasons this is happening? What does it mean for the environment? What are the political rationales for it? So why am I doing this, right? This is important, really important, because it helps you mitigate bias. So a lot of us, when we think about a category change, or we think of something we want to study, we're biased towards technology, because that's the most obvious, right? Instantly, when you think autonomous cars, you'll say, of course, there's technology that fuels it. But that means you might not be looking at things like social cultural. What are the social values doing? How are they changing? And you might miss out on the broader picture. So in many cases, steep C might reinforce each other. So they are the ones who are more likely to happen and should drive action. So for example, you're looking at a change and you realize there's a social driver for it. There's technological drivers for it. There's political will behind it. That's a change that's likely to happen, right? Versus something that's just, oh, the tech is there, but there's no social reason to do it. There's no political will to do it. It's actually really bad for the environment. That might be a change that might not happen, right? And so this is a way to push yourself to be creative, to move beyond your usual bias. So here's an example of how we've done it before. So this is a very dense slide, so bear with me. Let's just walk through it really quickly. So we think about health as a subject a really big passion point for many of our clients. How is health or healthcare changing? And we look at the social values around it where people are increasingly aware of the importance of their health. Technology is changing. It's increasingly able to monitor people anytime, anywhere, even though there are privacy concerns. Economic changes. Healthcare is increasingly expensive and shouldered by the consumer. Environmental. The world's increasingly dangerous, right, for health. If you think about the pandemic or climate change, the political, the public sector is really stressed. A lot of the time, the infrastructure is not enough to support the kinds of um, needs of a consumer, right? So the private sector is taking it on. And category companies are being disrupted by health startups. So that's the second column. The third one is the really interesting creative part, right? It's about clashing and combining the steep C factors to come up with new opportunities. So for example, if you add social and tech factors together, you get the, you get the opportunity where consumers need reassurance and tech can solve for that. So there's a space there. Or you might say, let's add economic um, plus political. Healthcare is expensive, but the public sector can't pay for it. So what role does the private sector pay? And there's an opportunity there. So this is a really interesting exercise. It's really fun to do, to just pick random um, letters out of the steep C and combine them to see what might come out. 
The third one is called backcasting. So you've all heard of forecasting. That's what a lot of us do. But have you ever done backcasting? So backcasting is useful when you have a clear vision of a specific future you want to achieve rather than building incrementally from today. So it's kind of a two-step process, right? It's not, okay, today I grew 5%. So next year I'll grow 5%. The year after I'll grow 5%. It's really in 2030, I want to hit $6 billion, right? And then it's working backwards to say, okay, well, then what does that mean for what I have to do 10 years from now? How about five years from now? How about two years from now? And working backwards. So that's a little, um, this two-step process can force creativity because you have a clear idea of where you want to go and then you move backwards. And it, as you can see on the graph, it can lead to more expansive thinking. So you're building off of vision rather than working incrementally from, okay, status quo, this is the amount I can grow. The last activity that I want to talk about is something we're gonna spend a lot of time to, on together because it's something that I love and something that I think will be fun to do. So it's called the Futures Wheel. And what the Futures Wheel is all about is it's invented by, surprise, futurists. And it's meant to think through all the implications of a change or a decision. It can be one we're making or one we observe, right? So the point of a futures map is to force us to find opportunities or threats that we might not have seen if we focused only on the immediate implications of our action. So it's forcing us um, by showing us the range of things that might be changing. It can lead to really creative breakthroughs and saying, hey, I didn't know that was connected. I'm going to look into that. Maybe this is a great solution or an opportunity or even a threat that I wouldn't have thought about if I had stuck to um, very direct cause and effect linear thinking, right? So we're going to do one now together just so we get a little bit of practice with a creative framework. And then we'll stop if we have time for any questions about the methodologies we use. Okay, so grab your pen and paper, um, grab your iPad if you want. This is easiest though, um, if you can draw, because as you can see, it becomes, it's very similar to a mind map. Okay. So in the middle of your paper, you're going to write down what's basically in the navy box to change. So for this exercise, I decided to think about the rise of the metaverse, something so many clients were interested in, um, and think about what that might be. So just write down the rise of the metaverse in the center of a circle. That's all we have to do for now. Okay. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to spend three minutes or two minutes, sorry, thinking of as many consequences for the phenomenon as you can. So filling in that pinkish red box, what is the consequence, the direct consequence of the rise of the metaverse? And you can even use some of your other um, frameworks here. So you can think of steep C, what are the social consequences, tech consequences, economic, et cetera? Or you can think of a mind map and just go broad. What are the effects, um, direct effects of the rise of the metaphor. So I'm gonna stop talking here and give you guys a little bit of time. Okay, so you probably have a few bubbles now. This is gonna be a little more challenging. For each bubble, think of second order consequences. What might that consequence lead to? What are the implications it might lead to? So think, this is very much like a ripple effect, okay? So we'll spend a little time here. This is a little harder, so I'll give you a little longer. doing it as well. 
Okay. And then you've got your second order consequences down. Let's do one more time. So if you remember at the start of the session, we talked about the need to push yourselves, right? So the first order is easy. Second order, maybe mm, a little harder. Let's push ourselves one last time. What are the third order consequences? What are the effects of the effects of the effects, right? And let's write that down. Okay, so let's stop here. I'm going to share my mind map. Um, and then I would love it if you guys can put in the chat what you might have thought, you know, what new implications you arrived at that you didn't think about when you began this exercise. What new ideas might have sparked? And what are the opportunities you then see from those third order or second order consequences, right? So I'm going to start, what did mine look like? So mine said in the middle, that change, rise of the metaverse, right? And my first order consequence, one of that was that, very obviously, you'll spend more time online, right? You'll, this literally, as the metaverse rises, more people get on the metaverse, they spend time online, okay? Easy. My second order was then, what does it mean if more people are spending time online? And I just flipped that, right? Then I said, you know, that means a lot of the time there will be less time outside without AI, without um, VR, right? Less time being literally connected to the metaverse, uh, less time being free from the metaverse rather, right? Still pretty easy. So what's my third order consequence? My third order was if I spend all my time, if I spend less time being free of the metaverse and all its demands, it means I might also have less time for considered mindfulness, right? So if I'm always, uh, I have very few times where I'm not being bombarded with metaverse messages, metaverse pings, I don't have as much time to myself. I don't have as much time to be spending with friends outside that experience. I don't have as much time to think about really, okay, do I really need that thing? Do I really want to do this um, activity, right? Because I have less time being connected to the metaverse. And that gives an opportunity for a brand that I might not have thought about in the beginning, right? Can my brand stand for things that are about literally going outside, literally getting that breath of fresh air, literally putting that time to think about what I want to do, putting time between what I want to do and what I might, when I might actually do it, right? How do I build in that space? And is that a space for my brand? So that's one way we can do it. I would love to see in the chat if you've got other ways of doing it. Otherwise, I'll show you one more example. So just to go back, this is another one. So for example, we're thinking about a 20% budget cut, right? Some things that you might come up with immediately is um, you can't recruit, you can't take on new staff. And what that means is you can't recruit a new office manager. And what that means is that there's lower productivity as your strategist, as your director spend time scrambling to find things like staplers or manage resourcing or do all those things that an office manager might be able to do, right? So this is one thing that might come out. Another third order thing is that you actually need, there's no external training, you need more internal training, and therefore an, there's an opportunity for skill sharing. Because you have less money, but now you can have people start teaching each other their skills, right? And this can go on and on and on. Okay. Okay. So that's the last framework. Right? So I'm gonna run a poll now. I would love to hear from you guys. 
which exercise did you like best? And I saw in the chat earlier that some people said mind mapping is something they tried to do. Um, so I'd love to see that. Yep, I, mind mapping and features feel really racing to the top. Interesting. I love that you love the future, Sweel. It is also my favorite. Um, and mind mapping is something we obviously do every day. So that's great. Steep C, interesting. I would love to hear from the Steep C and Backcaster voters um, in the chat while you're voting for that. Okay. So this is the poll. You'll see Futures Wheel, hopefully, maybe not biased because we did it together. Um, but that's a great one for us to do. Mind mapping, as I mentioned, we do this all the time. Happy to do this with you. It's a great way for us to explore and stretch. That's really a low investment. Steep C, more investment, but a little harder. I would love to hear in the chat, um, I can see one person voted for Steep C and one for backcasting. I would love to hear um, what drove this vote. Why is this your favorite? Aaron says, I've loved mapping since elementary school. Um, obviously this career was meant for Aaron, <laughs> just the sign perfectly for her. If you've got any questions as well, there's a Q&A box, please feel free to share. Steep C vote, Jessica says, um, she likes it because we consider factors we don't intentionally always consider. That's absolutely right. Um, especially as um, for a lot of us, we work in specific industries where one might win over the other. So for example, healthcare, a lot of the time with the rise of the pandemic, you might be thinking of only environmental factors. If you work in an industry that's heavily regulated, you might be looking at political factors, but there are so many other ways that you can think about a category um, and this forces you out of it. Okay. Backcasting creates a focus, especially with more rigid organizations. That's absolutely true. When we start with a big, um, a lot of the time we call it the wicked question or fearless forecast, you start with an intentionally huge, huge goal, something that you cannot achieve just with incremental growth. And that's what pushes people to think out of the box because they can't just say, well, we'll continue doing what we're doing because that is not going to hit your fearless forecast, right? And so that's why when backcasting comes in. So you can also be strategic about the exercise you do um, depending on your organization. Okay, so we're coming to our end of our time, but there are a couple last slides. So I just want to say that the learning doesn't have to stop here. We are not the only experts when it comes to creativity. Some, some books we recommend, for example, The Artist's Way. Um, this is great about for generating individual creativity, um, a way to prime the pump constantly for uh, how you write it. So some of her suggestions might be to write three pages every day. It can be anything. The first page is going to be easy. The next page is not so much, right? Or how do we live beyond fear um, and be creative, be creative? So this might be great for people who are not comfortable with discomfort. Steal Like an Artist is great. Creative Act for Curious People was designed by the D School um, in Stanford. So if you've ever heard of that, this is a great resource. It's chock full of frameworks and exercises and thinking fast and slow is wonderful too. And if you would like any of these books, we're happy to talk to you about them. And we've obviously worked with so many of you to jumpstart creativity. So thank you for that opportunity. Um, and we would love um, to work with you again on it. Jessica, you mentioned, are any of these books coming up in the book club? We will let you know. We have done some of them internally, but it's good to hear that they have interest beyond us. Okay, Jackie says we did Artist Way in 2020. Okay, so please um, for next steps, we're, and I'm going to end now, but please stay tuned for next book club. We're definitely gonna talk a little more about expanding thinking and all that. So that will be great. And yes, we'll send the presentation. Well, thank you everybody for the time spending those 45 minutes with me. Have a great day. If you've got any questions at all about the, can you can you walk, walk with me through steep sea or backcasting? I would love to do that. Um, as I mentioned, I love doing these creative things. So I'm really excited to hear from you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you so much for joining us.